Howdy, the purpose of this video is to walk you through your first refinement using MOD. Uh, this is an example of XRD refinement software. I'm going to assume you've already uh, seen the getting up and running video, uh, so you kind of know how to uh, load in data. We'll kind of go a little bit faster in that area. Um, but really here we're going to walk through step by step um, how you do the refinement process. Um, so if you haven't yet, go ahead and download um, MOD, uh, the software we're using to do the refinement. Um, obtain the extra uh, spectra you want to use. In this case, I'll be uh, working through an example using a quartz reference standard. Whoops. Um, and then obtain the initial SIF file, uh, the first guess of the, of the material you're trying to refine for. Um, really, the purpose uh, here is to kind of show you all the basic steps. Um, so we're not really learning anything new about quartz. In fact, if anything, the most important thing that we're learning is about the nature of the, uh, the, the instrument that we collected the data on itself. So we can export some instrumental parameters that will help us in the next um, refinements that we would do. Um, so just to show you ahead of time the basic things that we're going to be doing. Uh, first, we're going to be reading in the data files. Um, we can read in more than one SIF file if we're trying to refine for multiple phases. In this case, we won't. We are only looking for a single phase. Um, and then we're going to refine things, and we do it one at a time. So this is very standard in uh, X-ray refinement. Um, you don't basically click uh, refine all variables and, and say go, uh, because in many cases this is going to lead you uh, to a pathological result. So it'll, you'll get stuck in some local minimum somewhere, and you won't get a real answer out of it. Um, so what we usually do is we um, have everything fixed uh, initially, and we relax uh, the system uh, one degree of freedom at a time. Uh, and once we've refined one thing, oftentimes we're going to let it um, uh, continue to be able to be refined as we uh, refine later uh, variables. So you'll kind of get a sense for what I'm talking about as we walk through. Um, but this is the basic uh, uh, sequence that we're going to uh, use. And, and I think we're only going to do these first three steps in this example. So scale factor and background. We're going to look at lattice parameters, and then we're going to look at peak shape. So uh, one other thing to point you to ahead of time. Um, there is an excellent uh, tutorial, written tutorial, that describes uh, instrumental broadening uh, in MOD and how you deal with it. Uh, and so we're going to basically be doing uh, some of what this uh, walks you through, but uh, it's here in more detail, um, so you're free to uh, search this out and read it uh, at your own convenience. Um, again, uh, the refinement software we're using here is MOD. This is one example of a crystallographic um, XRD refinement uh, package. There are a number, there are a lot of commercial uh, packages. Uh, there are a few um, big ones that were developed by labs. So GSAS and FullProf are used in many, many research groups. We're using MOD because it's pretty accessible. It's pretty easy to pick up. It's free. It works on PCs and uh, Macs very well. Um, again, uh, the, the SIF files uh, can be found at the crystallographic open database. Uh, the one that we're going to be using uh, in this quartz. Um, I, I did a quick search just for the word quartz, uh, and the file that I'm uh, using in this example is 101.1097, um, so you can go ahead and download that uh, as well. Um, so uh, the first thing is to open up uh, mod. Uh, we can do this. And uh, I guess I had already read in the data. We can um, start over uh, just to make sure. Um, yep, remove. Just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, I don't need this anymore. I do need wherever I have stored my uh, data file. So I'm working with, uh, again, quartz. It has to be converted to a version uh, that mod reads. Um, and because mod is easy for certain things, we can just drag and drop, and here is our data uh, good to go. The next thing we do is go to phases, open up the SIF file, uh, and bring in uh, the quartz SIF file that we're planning on working on. Um, when I do this in Windows version, uh, it pops up this window. I select the phase I'm interested in, I hit choose, and it's brought it in. Um, and I can go ahead and ca calculate, and I see that there are peaks um, that align uh, calculated peaks. That's what these, um, oops, reset scale. That's what these uh, horizontal or vertical tick marks mean um, that are uh, corresponding pretty closely with all of our observed peaks already. Um, 
So, so far we have uh, gone through step one. We've read in the data and the SIP files. Um, I'm basically using everything on default mode at the moment, but you're going to start to see uh, where we start changing some of those. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is refine the scale factor and background. So I do want to point out that the way that mod works is that um, you have this giant tree of variables down here, um, and they're either set to be uh, fixed um, or refined. And so anything uh, that is fixed, if I um, hit a refinement cycle, so that's using this button up here, um, then that number is not going to change. Um, but if I change something uh, to refined, then when I hit this, um, internally the software basically is trying to reduce the total residuals between an observed data point and a calculated or a modeled uh, intensity uh, at a particular angle. Um, and it does this over the whole spectrum simultaneously. So it's taking the sum of all of these residuals and it's trying to minimize that. And it's trying to minimize it by um, changing different um, variable parameters in the model. Uh, and this is not the first one I want to change. I'm going to set that back to fixed. So I can, in, in mod, you can kind of go about things a couple different ways. Um, I'll show you an example. Um, the first thing we want to do is um, refine the scale parameter and the background. And so I could come under here. Uh, this light bulb is the wizard, and there are kind of a bunch of things packaged for you. Um, and I could say background and scale parameters and hit go. Um, and I see that the background has already shifted up, so it's closer to the background, and the scale has also shifted up, so my peak uh, intensities are somewhat closer to the observed peaks. Um, or I could have found where uh, that particular variable is uh, hidden in this tree. And, and the issue um, with this is just that uh, sometimes it's difficult <laughs> to find in mod where the particular parameters are that you're looking for. Uh, so this is one of what I think one of the downsides of mod is that they're all just kind of here. Um, we can find them in different places as well. Um, but as an example, um, if I close everything, um, so if I look under sample X, that's the, the sample uh, data set that I'm working with, and I open up, um, not layer one, but data file set X, then the background function in this case is a function that's given uh, that has three parameters and I can see now that these three have been set to refine. Um, so if I click uh, the refine button, um, this sometimes looks like a hammer, sometimes looks like a little cache register. Anything that is uh, set to refine could change a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and hit go. Um, these things, uh, the values did not change. I guess it already converged pretty well uh, initially. Um, one thing that we see in this particular data set is that the background has a large peak out here at 10. This could be due to a couple reasons. It could be due to um, the presence of uh, an amorphous sample holder. Um, it could be some kind of instrumental effect, but this is not what I'm trying to fit for. And you can see um, that if we zoom in here, the background, because there's only three uh, parameters, it's really struggling um, to fit uh, this observed data set out here. And that's going to make uh, everything else um, suffer because it's struggling to fit this up here, so the background isn't right here, so this peak is never going to be quite right. Um, so we could go about this a couple different ways. We could change the background function that we're using to fit give it more parameters so it allows it to sort of um, describe this broad peak uh, around uh, 10 degrees 2 theta. Um, but I'm going to do something else. I'm going to come into the data set um, and I'm going to click on the eyeball. This allows us to examine the data set. And I'm going to define an excluded region. So basically I see that my first peak is up here above 20 degrees. Um, and so I'm going to exclude everything that goes from 0 to um, 18 degrees. And I'm going to say, okay, oops, I don't think that actually did what I wanted it to do. Let me try this one more time. Um, exclude regions. I need to add a term. Aha, 
So I've added an excluded region. It goes from 0 to 18. And I'm going to say OK. And now I think we're right. And so what I want you to do is look carefully at what happens in this region um, and uh, to the values of this background function. Because um, while we're still going to see this data, really now it's just trying to fit everything uh, that's 18 degrees and up. And so I'm going to hit the Refine button. And I can see that background has dramatically decreased. And so it does a really good job now fitting um, everything above 18 degrees. And I can refine it again if I wanted to. Um, and uh, these values did indeed change. So even though we see something out here that doesn't do a good job of fitting at all, we don't care about that because that's not being calculated in the residuals. So only um, everything at 18 degrees and above is actually being calculated. Um, okay, so how are we doing? There are a couple ways to, to check how you're doing. Um, one is to look at this uh, RWP. This is a weighted um, residual number. Um, we want to get this number as low as possible. Um, that's okay, but really the best thing to do is to actually look at the peaks themselves. And so if I say reset scale, if I want to look at a particular peak, I just, in Windows, I left click, I draw a box around it, and that zooms in. So I can see that the peak alignment is okay, um, but the peak shape and intensity are terrible. And the two are related. The reason that it's not scaling the intensity higher is that I'm overfitting uh, the observed, or I have a higher than expected intensity um, uh, at lower angles, and I have a lower than expected intensity at higher angles. Um, if I look up here, kind of the same thing. These nice, well-defined peaks in the observed data set are really just smeared out. And so the issue is that um, the peak shape right now is very bad. Um, and I'm not even going to try um, to adjust uh, lattice parameters or peak positions yet. Because if I do it, I don't really have any confidence I'm going to get anything better because my peak shape is so bad. So I'm actually going to um, um, switch numbers 4 and 3 for this particular case. Um, so uh, the first time we changed something, uh, we did it using this wizard. Um, now I'm going to kind of try change things uh, a couple different ways. I'm going to find um, uh, the parameters in this tree, and I'm going to show you another way to find them as well. Um, so there are a couple things that cause peaks to be broad. And in mod, they're separated out into two different categories. One is things that um, affect the sample itself. Um, and, and these are uh, hidden down here. So if I close all the trees, just so I can show you where I got this, um, I'm going to open the particular phase that I'm fitting for. Um, and I'm going to look down here under the isotropic folder. And there are two terms um, that describe... Oh, something got messed up with my... Let's see if that fixes... There we go. Uh, there are two terms that describe um, size and microstrain, and both of these can serve to broaden peaks. So what I was starting to say was mod um, separates um, the things that are associated with the sample that could broaden the peak and the things that are associated with the instrument. So part of the purpose of going through this uh, protocol is to attain a good instrumental um, uh, background uh, parameter file. And so we're going to we collected data on a standard and the reason we did that is that we expect this standard does not have a small crystal size and does not have an inherent strain that is associated with broadening. Um, and so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to change these numbers so that there's no more uh, impact from crystal size uh, or from strain. And so size, I'm going to set it to a large number. Um, I think I set it to a million. It doesn't really matter. It just has to be um, a very large number. Um, and, and that's because if I have a very large grain size, then that does not contribute to peak broadening. Similarly, micro strain, I'm going to set to zero because if there's no residual strain in the grains, then that also does not contribute to broadening. So I'm going to leave these as fixed, but I'm going to hit calculate and see what that does to our peak. So keep an eye on our peak here. Hit calculate. And we can see already it's gotten a lot sharper. 
and it got sharper exactly because I turned off things that are associated with peak broadening at the sample level. Um, so the, for the purpose of this exercise, I'm going to leave these alone from, from now because, again, the reason that we ran this quartz um, sample uh, is because uh, we're, we're intentionally using a sample that has a large grain size um, and does not have a residual strain. Um, okay, so the other thing that contributes to broadening, and I can zoom out um, just to see how we're doing, uh, is uh, some terms that are associated with the instrument itself. And so if I come uh, back to data sets and I click the eyeball, um, all of that information is, in capture, is captured uh, within this box that says instrument. Um, and you'll see a couple things. We can hit edit and we can see uh, what uh, it is using right now. Um, but basically, if you haven't done anything else with mod yet, it's using some default parameters that were collected on somebody else's instrument, not on yours. And so they don't really have a lot of relevance to the particular data file that we're looking at. Um, so the goal here is that we're going to adjust these parameters so that they do a much better job fitting, and then we can store them. So you can make a uh, instrument uh, parameter file associated with the particular instrument that we collected this data on. Um, so those of you who are doing this uh, for the lab for Texas A&M, um, this was collected from the chemistry lab, the Brooker short arm instrument, and this is the same instrument uh, that you're going to be using uh, to collect your data in 301 lab. Um, so let's go ahead and click edit again. Um, I'm going to leave these things here for now, but I just want to talk about what they mean. Um, uh, angular uh, intensity calibration, um, it, this is something where if you've independently done a calibration to know something about the x-ray intensity, um, you can put in that information here. We haven't done that. Um, angular calibration is basically saying, what if your detector you know, thinks it's at 10 degrees two theta, say, but it's not. It's not exactly there. Um, and so there's some kind of disalignment, and we're going to leave that um, um, uh uh, leave that like that for now. Um, I, I should say that um, I can then come back down in this tree below and I can find that parameter associated with instrument disalignment. Um, geometry is the geometry of your system. Um, so most powder diffraction instruments uh, use a standard Bragg Brentano geometry. We're going to leave that uh, as it is. Um, we have a theta to theta system. This again is talking about um, kind of geometric effects. Um, X-ray tube is uh, the default standard, and this is assuming uh, that you have um, a standard um, uh, X-ray cube, um, and most of them uh, are uh, made with copper, and so the X-ray radiation is the K-alpha wavelength of copper. Now, um, this is a good point to come back here, say, okay, 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 and point out the fact that all of our peaks actually have um, a large tick mark and a small tick mark. And that's because copper K alpha is not a single wavelength. It's actually two very closely spaced wavelengths, K alpha one and K alpha two. So at low two theta angles, this looks like a peak and a shoulder. If I come up to higher angles, um, they're separated enough so I could clearly resolve the two different peaks. Um, but, but that's the reason why we have doublets for all of our peaks because um, any, um, any standard powder source uses a tube, uh, and the copper actually has uh, two closely spaced wavelengths, K-alpha-1, K-alpha-2, where the intensity of K-alpha-1 is twice of that uh, of the intensity of K-alpha-2. Uh, reset scale. So let me come back here where we were before. We were looking at our diffraction instrument. Uh, we came down to source. Detector, it doesn't really matter. Um, I think we're going to leave it as a uh, scintillation detector um, for now. Um, but this is the important thing. Instrument broadening, um, there are a number of different functions that we can use to describe uh, a peak. Um, and usually we use uh, what's called a pseudo-voit, which is a combination of a Lorentzian peak and a Gaussian peak. Um, and there are a couple different uh, uh, parameters that we can fit for uh, that um, uh, describe that function. 
And if I open up under options, uh, I can see what they are. And so there are asymmetry parameters. There are parameters that talk about the basically the full width, the, the width of the peak. So this is half width at half max. There's a Gaussianity parameter, so how Gaussian versus how Lorentzian is the peak. And then there are a bunch of different broadening terms. Um, so if we look at these, we can see that there are already values loaded up in here for a lot of these things. And that's again, that's because mod um, comes with some default uh, parameters that are basically um, from uh, some system somewhere that don't have any relevance to our system. So we're going to reset these, uh, and then we're going to start to refine them ultimately. Um, so I want to walk you through um, asymmetry value 0. We're going to set to be 500. Value 1, we're going to say is 0. So it turns out that um, uh, large values mean not asymmetric. Uh, and if you start out with a 0 here, then it has trouble um, refining further beyond that point because there's a... Um, a uh, the function uh, has a discontinuity uh, near the origin. Um, so half width, half max, we're going to reset these. 0 0.005. We're going to set this at 0, set this at 0. So again, all we're doing now is kind of giving it a better starting point um, that will help us uh, go forward from here. So Gaussian value... Uh, 0 0.5, and we'll say this is 0, um, and we're going to leave all of these broadening terms to, uh, to be 0, and that's where they were initially. Uh, so I'm going to say OK, uh, OK, and OK. And so I've changed the, uh, the parameters that are describing these peaks, um, but I haven't recalculated yet. So if we look at one particular peak, so I'm looking at this one, down by 21 degrees, and I hit the calculate button, we can see, again, um, there's been a sharp uh, a change in the peak. It has dramatically gotten sharper. Um, and if I look out here, I say the same thing at, at high angles. And so now I can start to see that actually my peak alignment is not so good. Um, and I can see that now because I have sharper peaks. So this is a pretty good first guess. Um, it's absolutely not perfect, um, but... Uh, it is going to allow us to kind of go through the sequence the way we wanted to. So at this point, um, we're going to step back and refine these lattice parameters, and then we're going to go further on the peak shape refinement. Um, I should point out um, that everything that we changed up there, you can find somewhere down here. Uh, sometimes it just takes a little bit of time. So um, the lattice parameters, the things we're going to change next, are, again, hidden underneath the phase. So there's the cell length A and length C. Um, there are no angles, alpha, beta, gamma, to refine because this is a hexagonal cell. So the, the angles are fixed. There's nothing that we can refine there. Um, uh, isotropic, this is what we changed before. Um, atomic structure, this is basically where are the silicon atoms, what is the occupancy, all of these kind of things. Um, the information that we just changed uh, should be underneath data file set and here under diffraction instruments. So you can see there's a folder Cagliotti um, PV. Um, these, are the, these are the values that we typed in before. So you can always come here um, and type it in by hand as well. Uh, that's equally valid. Um, everything is fixed. Uh, so the first thing that I want to do was come back and set the lattice parameter A and C to be refined. Um, and from here on out, we're going to do everything by hand. So we're going to tell things to refine here. Um, and, and keep in mind that we're, we're still refining our initial um, scale factor and background. Um, and, and this is a common thing. Again, once you've refined something and it's gotten to a good point, you keep it um, uh, under the refined status so that it can improve a little bit. So, for example, when I change the lattice parameters, that's going to let the background get a little bit better as well. Um, so if I want to change a parameter and I want to refine it, I can click the cache register up here. I want you, in this case, to take an, keep an eye on this RWP value and see what happens after we run through some refinements. And it has decreased dramatically. So we went from about 45 to 20. Uh, and that's because our peaks are starting to align a lot better. 
And so we're, uh, we're doing pretty well. We're getting a lot better. Uh, if I look at the difference curve, I can still see there's always a difference associated with each of these peaks. Um, so we're not done yet, but we're doing pretty well. There's nothing that is systematically off. Um, so uh, the one thing that I haven't re uh, relaxed yet that I probably should is this instrument disalignment parameter. Um, and again, this is just if there's an offset on the detector scale. Um, so I'm going to set that to refined and go again. Um, and again, that doesn't have a big impact here at all. Our RWP got down a little bit smaller, um, but, but nothing too significant. Um, so what have we done so far? Um, we refined uh, the scale factor and background, and that keeps getting better each time. Uh, we refined the lattice parameters. Um, and so if we look at all of our peaks, um, we're, we're pretty happy with the alignments. Um, but the thing that we haven't done yet is we haven't gotten these peak shapes quite right. And this is easiest to see if you look at something like this guy maybe. Um, there's some intensity out here we don't do. This one actually is a little bit too broad. Um, so the observed peak actually has a, a well-defined uh, second peak here. Um, the model peak is just a shoulder. Um, and I'm a little bit too broad down here. Uh, so what we're going to do now is come back to these Cagliotti um, uh, peak broadening variables. And we're going to start to refine some of them. And we're not going to do it all at the same time um, because there's no need. Uh, we can easily do them um, sort of bit by bit. Um, and so the first things that we're going to do are the Cagliotti values uh, here, here, and here. I'm going to be a little bit cautious here. So you could probably um, set more to refine all at once, um, but I'm going to do them one by one. And so I can see my RWP has decreased. Um, I'm doing a little bit better up here, um, and I'm still doing a pretty good job out at higher angles. So let's now uh, allow the asymmetry to refine as well. Do it again. And each of these things is going to be associated with a little bit better. RWP hasn't changed much, um, but we're allowing it to, we're increasing the degrees of freedom that are used to describe the peak shape. Um, and so it should be able to do a little bit better each time. Uh, so the last thing I'm going to do is turn on uh, the Gaussian values here and here. I'm going to run it again. And for good measure, I'll do it one more time. Um, and so at this point, I'm getting uh, about to where I'm happy. So if I look at this low angle one, uh, this is, uh, in all, for all intents and purposes, a pretty good fit of our peak. Um, on this particular peak, uh, we're not quite perfect here, uh, although I suspect um, that some of these uh, intensity out here and here is associated with um, uh, a little bit of contamination of our uh, x-ray beam. It's not perfectly a copper K-alpha. Sometimes you have some K-beta or some tungsten um, uh, uh, wavelength slip through. Um, so all in all, we're looking pretty good. Um, and, uh, and and the purpose here so far is that we've, we've gotten dramatically better description of the instrument um, that we're using. Uh, and so at, at uh, at this point, um, we're gonna we're gonna not press on any further. Um, the next things that you would do, well, maybe we'll, we'll allow uh, atomic positions to relax. But you could you could keep doing things. You could relax atomic positions. You could relax um, preferred orientation. So if I look at the difference curve, I see that uh, in this case, uh, my intensities, model intensities, are a little bit higher than the predicted ones. But over here, it's lower than the predicted one. Um, so this is a sign that there might be a little bit of preferred orientation um, in the sample. Um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and show you that one additional thing. Um, if I come to atomic structure, silicon, and oxygen, uh, we could allow um, uh, some of these uh, atomic site fractions to change. Um, but because of the symmetry um, of the structure, uh, really, this uh, atomic site fraction X is the only um, number that we could expect to change for silicon. 
so we'll change that to refine. Um, uh, whereas oxygen, all of these could refine. Uh, and this is actually something I don't know. So I'm going to set uh, the Y and Z coordinate of the silicon to refine as well. And I suspect it is smart enough that it's not going to end up varying that number at all. Um, so I didn't see... Yeah, so the, uh, the positions are um, basically changing very negligibly. Um, and it did have some improvement, right? So our RWP is down to 12. Um, it allowed uh, some of the intensities here to balance out. Um, so again, the biggest uh, sort of um, lacking uh, right now is associated with this uh, strongest uh, peak um, and potentially with some uh, contamination of the peak. So at this point, uh, I'm going to say that we're pretty happy with our refinement. Um, I mean, it's hard to get uh, too much better than this. Um, but what we want to do is go to our data file set, and particularly for our diffraction instrument, we want to store um, all of these Cagliotti um, uh, parameters um, as a file so that we could use that for the next run that we do. Um, so basically, um, we collected data on one particular instrument. We collected data from a reference standard. In this case, it was uh, polycrystalline quartz. Um, and we use that standard, um, to, uh, s uh, we use that particular material um, because it has a large grain size and small residual strain. Uh, and so the interpretation is that all of the um, broadening and all of the shape of the peaks is really coming from the characteristic of the instrument rather than the sample. And so what this allows us to do is that next refinement we do, uh, we're, we're able to use these uh, particular um, peak values as a starting point. So I'm going to say store, and you can save it uh, wherever you want to save it. I'm going to save it on the desktop here. I'm going to call it uh, Brooker Short Arm. Um, oops. What did I do? I don't know what I did. Store. Um, okay. So it should try and store it. I'm, I'm blanking on the uh, extension um, that it wants to use to store the file right now. And somehow, let's see, diffraction instrument, that's right. Uh, this all looks fine. Um, Uh, okay, well, so it's saved a file, and, uh, and again, it gave it no extension at all. Um, so I'm going to have to look up what the, uh, what the extension it, it's looking for is. I think it's something like .mdb, um, but that's something that we can do. Um, and I should be able to, if I wanted to, come back to wherever I saved it, um, Burger Short Arm, open it, um, and select this name, say choose, and it's basically read in all of those parameters. Um, so the next uh, the next refinement you do, you can uh, you can basically do this. You can uh, you can open up this starting guess with your instrument parameters, and you're going to be a lot closer at the very beginning. Um, and depending on what you're doing, um, you know, in the sample you're looking at, uh, you might turn off all of those instrument. Um, uh, uh, you might not refine uh, all of these things that refine this time around. So you might not refine the Cagliotti um, parameter values and instead um, say that uh, if we have a broader peaks, that's because of something on the sample side. And so we might then start to refine a crystallite, crystallite size or microstrain value and, and obtain some information about the actual sample. Um, okay, that's it. Uh, good luck with future refinements.